and also to anyone who might miss the call, we'll be distributing the PowerPoint and this presentation after. Um, before we get started, uh, everyone, I am Sam Hartsock. I'm the Director of Education at Remake. And for those of you who might not know who Remake is, we're a nonprofit working to make fashion a force for good. We use first-hand documentary shorts and photo-rich stories to help people meet the women who make our clothes. We share facts and have curated lists of sustainable brands to help people break up with fast fashion and to help everyone be inspired to buy better. And it's our goal to remake the closets of one million women by 2025. Uh, so a little background before I hand it over to Jamil to lead us through this conversation. Um, this conversation around you know what are the healthcare guidelines to face mask and sewing face masks and donating them came up during our conversation last week that we as an ambassador community were having with Aisha, the founder of Remake. She was talking about Remake's response to COVID-19, you know, moving our events to being online, to what is our response to ensure that you know the women who are vulnerable in this supply chain are are protected. How are we working to protect our garment workers? Um, and during that conversation, Jamil raised his hand to talk more about like also what can we do to apply the skills that we have and many of those skills are uh, sewing and creating face masks and giving them to uh, to people in our community to health workers on the front line and what does that look like and doing in a way that follows CDC guidelines um, and also ensuring that they are safe to us, safe to the people who can use them. Um, so also, if anyone's on this call wants to be a part of more of those community ambassador conversations or to help volunteer with Remake, um, please reach out to me at sam at remake.world and we can loop you into more of these conversations. Um, with that, I want to hand things over to Jamil. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, my name is Jamil Shaw, everyone. I am a Remake ambassador and I'm also going to be graduating from George Washington University with a master's in public health. And I just want to, before I get started, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for coming today, for your time, for your energy, for your enthusiasm. This whole presentation is going to be about part education, part group discussion. Since we all have a different perspective on this really critical topic right now, I really want to be able to learn from all of you as well. So I'm going to be asking you guys to jump in, making sure that if you have any questions, we can have them put into the chat box. There's going to be a, a long 15 to 20 minute Q&A session at the end. So we want to really be able to make sure that we create that space where we can learn through our community of, our, of, our, of practice and we can learn from one another. Um, I also want to thank Sam and Aisha and a uh, special shout out to Riza, who is a part of our DC Remake uh, community and chapter who helped me build these slides. I just want to thank you all for this opportunity to present. It really means a lot. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So because I want this to be a community uh, community event and I want everyone to kind of pitch in their ideas and their thoughts and everything while we're learning together, I just want some of you to volunteer and go around with your name, what your occupation is. So for me, I'm Drew Mill Shaw and I'm almost done with my master's in public health at George Washington University. My reason for attending was really trying to understand some of the guidelines that are out there, what are some of the myths myths and what are some of the common misconceptions that people in our communities might be following because there's so much misinformation out there. I wanted to try and embark on a small journey to understand what's really compliant and what's not. Um, and what I really hope to gain from this session is understand some of the clarity or gain some more clarity on the issue and learn from all of you actually um, because of the issue of there being so much misinformation even if I did find resources that were uh, evidence-based research studies because the issue is so new and there's not well studied there might be better studies out there that could talk about the issue so if you haven't if any of y'all have looked at that um, or have heard anything from healthcare professionals in the field about what's working what's not i'm really excited to learn from everyone so with that if anyone would like to volunteer feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in popcorn style I can share. Um, I'm, I'm Mila. I am a undergraduate student and junior at Duke University. Um, my reason for attending is because I know how to sew 
And I feel like I really want to be able to help. And I feel like this is the way that I can help. And what I hope to gain from this session is to learn how to help. Because, I mean, if I just got to sewing masks, that's not necessarily effective. So I know there's rules and ways for it to be sanitary and, like, all these different things to consider when doing this. And so I'm really hoping to learn about all that. Thank you so much for sharing, Mila. Uh, and I'm glad that you brought up a good point. If you have sewing skills, it's really important that we are mindful about how we're approaching this specific issue, as it is going to be a little bit more critical in how we create the types of, uh, what types of materials we use and what types of patterns we're using. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, so thank you for sharing. I can share. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so my daughter and I, my daughter actually is the one who's sewing and she has been asked by um, relatives for masks and then also um, some elderly neighbors want masks. And we just want to make sure that when we're creating these masks that we're actually doing helping versus harming and giving people a false sense of security. And also we don't want them to feel like they're suffocating if it's not the right material. Awesome. Thank you, Laurel, for sharing. And I'm excited to see what you and your daughter gain out of this, um, especially for our more at-risk populations. It's critical that we consider what type of face masks are actually going to be protective for them versus the populations that may not need um, some of the more heavier fabrics that we would want to use. So I'm looking forward to learning from the community about some of those as well. Um, it looks like in the chat box uh, we have Hang. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Or is it Hong? I I'm really sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I would love it if you could uh, correct me, but otherwise I will try. Uh, she works in campaigns or or I just want to double check. Well, Ham works in campaigns um, and advocacy on global health for an NGO in Canada. And she also knows how to sew. Um, I'm curious about rules and regulations for face masks since there's been a lot of conflicting information. So I'm really excited to share about that as well. And with the information that we've gathered, it's been largely uh, across the board in terms of what countries they're coming from. We, there's still probably not enough information out there about this specific topic and the very nitty gritty that we need to get into. So the resources that I've put into this specific um, slideshow, you can do more in-depth research as they were gathered by healthcare professionals and nurses who are on the front lines. So thank you so much for your time and energy. Is there anyone else that would like to share? Um, yeah, we'll take, before we'll take get... yeah, we'll take one more if anyone's I'll go, if that's okay. Yeah. Hi, my name's Martina. I am a recent graduate from the University of Arkansas, but I'm originally from Bolivia. Um, I got introduced to Remake through a Net Impact conference, like I think two or three years ago, maybe. And um, the reason I am asking this is for the other part of the thing that we're doing, the donating health guidelines, you know. Um, how does this work? Are we talking only face masks or is it referring to other types of supplies that we're allowed to donate. So today's just the topic of face masks, mainly because there's been so much buzz in the media about face masks, and it is a specific per personal protective equipment that is um, usable and is being used by more than just healthcare professionals. It's also used being, being used by the general public. And so that's why we're focusing on just donations for that. But the resources that I've put in here and the websites that I've vetted accept all, all PPE, and they have specific uh, tabs on their websites to talk about what the specific guidelines are for that PPE. So if you're gonna be able to donate gloves, it's gonna talk about what type of gloves. If you were going to go and donate face shields, it would talk about what those protocols are. Uh, and so we've gathered some really great resources and websites for that. Awesome. Well, we're going to move on to the next slide. I'm really glad that we got some more people joining in. And for the people that don't know, feel free to put in your information in the chat box. If you have any questions, put that in the chat box. We're going to answer all those questions in the Q&A later on in the presentation. Um, and before I get started, we have Natalia, who's a fashion designer from Mexico City. And she came here because she has a repair shop uh, in Mexico, and she would like to also help with supplies 
um, that they can sow. So Talia, thank you so much for coming from across the border. We're very, very glad that you're here. Um, a lot of these resources that I'm going to be talking about are specific to the U.S. In, in terms of donations. However, in terms of sewing guidelines, the websites provide information from physicians and nurses that have created these patterns in conjunction with other, um, other people. So that is going to be helpful for you. So now we're I'm just going to keep the conversation going. I want to get a sense of where everyone's at in terms of their knowledge level and how they how you guys think we got to this issue. Why there might be an issue in the supply chain? What's going on? Why do we have to get regular people to be able to make and donate masks? I would love for the community anyone can jump in again popcorn style to share thoughts and knowledge about what you've read people you've talked to if you're an industry expert maybe you have some great expertise that you can share with the community but when we're responding to some of the sharing i want people to respond with an improv technique called yes and and there's a reason for this we really want to emphasize that this is a community gathering and this is a community learning opportunity and that we're learning from one another and, and since there's so much misinformation out there, it's really easy to refute someone's thought or refute someone's source of knowledge without having vetting it ourselves. So in order to build on the idea, we want to be able to say, yes, I acknowledge what you're saying, and I want to build uh, and put on top of that. And so that way we can create a whole network of ideas and see where the patterns lie. So if anyone wants to get started about where they where we think this might have this issue may have started, if there's anyone that would like to share how we got to this critical uh, position in, in the world, I'd love to learn from you. Hi, um, my name is Laura and uh, I'm, I'm uh, situated in, in Toronto in Canada and I think one of the major issues is that um, a lot of uh, people started taking um, N95 masks um, that were not like frontline um, uh, healthcare workers. And so they're, they're running out um, in our hospitals and they're asking um, nurses to uh, keep, keep masks for two to three days, um, which puts, them at risk and everyone else in risk. So what we're trying to do is um, make masks for, you know, regular folk or low risk. Uh, so that frees up a lot more supplies that are actually suitable for the frontline workers. So that's, that's how I think we've gotten, at least in Toronto, uh, here. Uh, I think another thing that's been going on, um, and the reason why I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this conversation, is that there have been a, there's been a number, a number of representations in the interest of meeting uh, people's needs that don't necessarily align with the law. Like for example, one of the things that uh, got uh, me sort of doubling down on this as as a lawyer and professor is there was a document that was going on online saying follow these directions to make an N95 mask, and that they're very specific rules about certifying that and sort of who's providing it and. And, and what to do in the United States for masks that come from other countries but aren't, and that may, be, may meet the standards but aren't certified here. Um, and uh, there, there are some things here that could get some fashion brands and some designers in trouble from a broader product liability standpoint, truth and advertising standpoint, um, consumer protection. Uh, so it's, it's become a crucial, crucial issue to discuss. Hi, um, could I just add to Everyone, so uh, bigger picture wise, like systematic, um, like a systematic viewpoint wise, I think generally the difficulty with public health and population health is that um, when things work, nothing happens. For example, like when vaccines work, people don't get sick. So I feel like that's why also um, complacency happens in terms of uh, pandemic preparedness and like general epidemic preparedness. So um, I think this is a very hard lesson in that to, to better serve the public um, and to be more prepared for outbreaks like this, we do have to think more long-term in the future and, and like backstock more materials and PPE in the future.
Anyone else? Um, yeah, I'm here on the line. I'd, I'd like to add, so yes and. Um, so I'm Liahana, I run our Restore, and I have um, a community of sewers who are up for making masks. I wanted to take it underneath the brand and I've been following other brands who are, you know, trying to help in the way that they can help. Um, but I want to ensure that the way we go about it is really, um, you know, ethical and that it is going to make a difference. Um, a lot of what we work with is um, textile waste. And so really ensuring um, that whatever cloth or textile we're using is actually going to help. Um, and so I've been doing research on it for the past two days and we have prototypes of masks. And so I hopped on this phone call to see what other brands are doing. Um, so yeah. Yes. And I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. We can hear you um, for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Bailey Rose and um, something, how did we get here from a larger picture is, and how are so many people making masks at home with no direction? Um, a lot of sewing manufacturing went overseas because the states has have so such strict labor laws. And so I think that that's also another problem that we're coming into face with that we just don't even have manufacturing anymore. And then the mask making that is happening is so isolated with all of these like craftswomen at home. I'm in Colorado and there's multiple craft making groups in Colorado. And so there's just different threads and information everywhere. And there's no like centralized major manufacturing facilities because all of it's overseas or not all of it is a lot of it has gone overseas. Yes, I agree with all of you. And Maria, who's a fashion design industry professional, says that she's making 100% uh, cotton masks and donating them to, the, to her uh, local hospital. And she wanted to make sure that they're, they were, since they're not medical grade, what was going to be helpful and what wasn't. Um, I would like to echo that everything everyone has shared so far. Thank you for sharing. And now I'm going to go into some of the more guidelines and what I found in the research. But before I get started with that, I want to thank you all for sharing. Thank you all for being open and vulnerable and allowing yourself to give this space to learn especially in these crazy unprecedented times. It's awesome to see people like yourselves, educating yourselves, making sure you're sharing the proper information for everyone. So that way we can address all those challenges that are happening all the way from the individual level to the systematic level that we've talked about. And all those challenges from the different articles that I've read and the news, uh, news, news articles, research, as well as people I've spoken with in the field have shared that level of go. In terms of there was a, a a uh, supply chain issue, there was a political issue, there was also just a um, not enough having workers, higher demand, not being prepared enough. There are so many different challenges. So we wanted to use this slide as an opportunity to share everyone what everyone has learned uh, rather than creating a whole separate presentation, which it could have been about that specific topic. So let's get started. So here's what we found in the research. So in this study, this study was done in 2014. This was the only randomized control trial that I could find um, that looked at medical masks and cloth masks and compared them in Vietnam in multiple high-risk hospital centers um, for healthcare workers. And what the data shows is that this randomized control trial, hospital wards were randomized to three different conditions, medical masks, cloth masks, or a control group. The control group was just basically, it was usual practice. So the usual practice in Vietnam is that in, in lots of Asian countries, especially East Asian countries, we'll notice that general practice is to put on a cloth mask because these are generally low resourced uh, areas and cloth masks are very affordable and they're usable for, uh, for hospital conditions and for clinical conditions. So general practice was to reuse masks, uh, specifically cloth masks or use a medical mask. So that is why they, these are the three conditions for this study. Now what they found was that the rates of all infection outcomes 
were highest in the cloth mask. So if you look at the CRI, which is a um, specific type of uh, clinical respiratory infection, it could be multiple different strains of bacteria. This was a 1.5 times higher risk of infection rate in the cloth mask compared to a medical mask. Now, in this study, medical masks were just considered regular surgical masks. They weren't N95s. However, for influenza-like infections, they saw a 13 times higher likelihood of getting infection. I do want to point out that this specific study talks about the use of a surgical mask or a regular cloth, ma cloth mask, which was made out of cotton, in very high risk areas. So it was a really interesting study for me to pick out for today's discussion because it's simulating what would be done in a pandemic. What's actually very interesting is that in the discussion section, so at the very end of the paper, they talk about some of the uses of the study. And they said that in general conditions, we don't recommend anyone to use a cloth mask. But they did say that in a pandemic, especially in low resourced areas, a cloth mask might be needed, but it's not recommended that they even then, because, and because uh, healthcare workers are just gonna be at really high risk. There's not enough research to showcase what is the efficacy of a cloth mask to protect against certain diseases over a, cert over a regular mask or a surgical mask. So that was one of the issues that they brought out to light with this study. Now, in the three different types of masks, here's what are some of the differ differentiators. We have three regular masks that we're talking about in the news and the media and what is being offered to healthcare workers. We have N95 respirators, which is a special type of masks that protect against air particles that are greater than or equal to 0 0.3 microns, um, which is one one thousandth of a milliliter. And most viruses are anywhere in the size between 0 0.5 to 0 0.2 microns. So they have a pretty high, high efficacy to filter against viruses and filter against bacteria. But with specifically the coronavirus, we've seen that it lasts in aerosols. So it lasts in the air for up to four hours. Unlike regular viruses like influenza, which is more common and what these masks were originally designed for, really, they could, they, it's hard to protect against that. The reason being is because since the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus, current COVID-19 virus, can stay in the air for so long, it, it, the, the exposure rate of these healthcare professionals increases as well. And although the mask can filter out some of those particles, after a while, if there's too many particles out there, the, the filtration rate decreases. So that's why there's such a huge issue with uh, N95 respirators, and that's why they're disposable. We want to get rid of them once they start stop being filterable. Now we move on to surgical masks. Surgical masks also protect against air particles that are greater than or equal to 0 0.3 microns but their efficacy, their filtration efficacy is a lot lower. One of the studies that I found said it was about 60 to 80% in really high risk clinical care settings. Um, that same study found that it was three times more likely to protect against particulates than compared to homemade masks. And then lastly, homemade masks, which are the ones that we're gonna be talking about today are made out of cotton, do protect against your own air and fluid particulates and the size of that is debated, and there's no, not really any research done on that yet, at least the ones that I found. Um, but the study that we found that kind of compared the difference between these three was that it was half as protective as the surgical mask, and it was 50 times less protective than the N95 mask. Um, So Victoria pointed out a really good point. So in this slide, I say that most viruses are from 0.05 to 0.2 microns, and the N95 respirators protect against air particles that are greater than or equal to 0 0.3 microns. But the reasons why they help protect against viruses as well is because the type of polymer that, it, the, that the fabric is made out of is able to uh, attract on a polarity level that traps the particles. So that's why. 
Um, I'm sorry if I was if that was misleading, and I, I should have clarified that. But that's what makes the N95 respirator so unique. They're made out of a specially charged polarized material, which is polypropylene, which is medical grade, and that's what uh, most certifications require when we are creating the masks. So that was a really great question that you brought out there, Victoria. Um, and that level of detail is uh, is going going into more detail is going to be a little bit beyond my scope. Um, because I've done enough research into some of the more uh, high-end aspects of the certification that you would need to uh, access in order to qualify for a medical grade technology and medical grade efficacy. But from the initial, no, 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 you're fine, you're fine. But the initial research that I did do is that these special masks have that level of uh, fabric that allows you to capture the polarity difference that viruses have because they are RNA molecules and so they can be captured and filtrated through that purpose. But going back to the homemade masks, because they're not effective, we I wanted to see what we could do as people, regular people, wanting to donate masks in this very dire situation, how can we see what materials could be the best? So there was a great study that was done in 2013 that was put in the um, journal, the, the uh, Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness Journal in 2013. And it looked at various households materials effectiveness against one micron particles. Now, the sample size of this study was only 21 people. So what this study looked at was 21 St there, it was uh, different styles of homemade masks made for 21 healthy individuals in regular conditions. So keep that in mind. It was in re under regular conditions, and they tried to simulate the size of the particle by using very uh, similar sized bacteria and similar sized viruses compared to the influenza virus. So keep that in mind. The surgical mask was obviously the most efficacious at covering about 97% of the particulates. The next level was vacuum cleaner bags. And the reason for that is because they have a special type of filter called a HEPA filter that allows them to protect against some of those types of um, some of those types of uh, particulate matters. And oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. And then the next three were regular common homemade or things that were available in the home. So we looked, they looked at dish towels, cotton blend t-shirts, 100% cotton t-shirts, antimicrobial pillowcases, scarves, pillowcase, regular pillowcases, linen and silk. From all the different types of materials that are available, we can clearly see that linen and silk has a very low efficacy for uh, filtering particles. And some of the highest ones were a dish towel, a cotton blend t-shirt, and 100% 100 cotton t-shirt. Now, someone might ask, why can't we use a vacuum cleaner bag or a dish towel to help protect against ourselves, against the virus? And the biggest challenge that they came across was the breathability. For regular people, or even in high risk areas, like for healthcare workers, breathability is one of the criteria that we really have to look out for in terms of the, the length of use with the mask. Because a lot of these masks that healthcare workers are wearing, especially the N95, it's tightly around their mouth. And the reason for that is so that way the air can filter through the pores of the mask. And the air that they breathe in goes through those pores, which is how they capture the particulate, which is how they can make sure they can uh, protect themselves against the viruses and the bacteria. Because the vacuum cleaner bags and the dish towels are too thick, your, the likelihood of you having an adverse reaction of using that material is higher. You might not get enough air travel going through to uh, use it, especially in these high risk conditions where you might have to wear these masks for more than eight hours at a time, especially if you're low on specific materials and supplies. You would, right now, healthcare professionals are considering reusing the masks that they're already wearing, which is a huge issue. So, so a lot of the guidelines that we found are using cotton, um, specific cotton uh, materials. And I'm gonna go into the differences in using a cotton blend versus a 100% cotton t-shirt and why the suggestion is to use the 100% cotton t-shirt for now. 
Before I get into that, this is what the CDC wrote, that fabric masks do not effectively protect against COVID-19. And that is the truth. However, under the conditions that we're in, it is a last resort for healthcare providers and should be requested by them. So you'll notice that if you're gonna go donate to specific hospitals or specific clinical care settings, that they might have already set some guidelines or some criteria that they want the donators to follow for the masks that they're getting. Ideal conditions, you would have a, a medical grade PPE, so medical grade certified PPE available that isn't that has been used untouched, hopefully not expired, that, that, you, that you can donate. But because that we have to create these, they suggest that the clinicians and the healthcare providers that are using these face masks only use them in low risk areas where you're not in contact with the COVID-19 patient, where you're more likely to be in contact with healthier individuals. And if you are going to use those masks, you want to make sure that you, the, the, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, the healthcare provider want, should make sure that they use it by wearing it over the N95 mask. And they also have a face shield. So the, a plastic face shield should cover the entire front of the, of the face, and then the mask should be made to be able to gently fall over an N95 mask because many of the healthcare guidelines are suggesting that by wearing a cloth, cloth mask over the N95 mask, it can capture some of the particulates that would have been caught by the N95 mask before it, uh, before, uh, before it could be re, um, used up. How's everyone doing so far? Is everyone following? Am I being confusing in any way? I'm throwing a lot of sciencey jargon at you, a lot of <laughs> really technical stuff. How's everyone doing? So far, so good? I just wanna take a minute, check in. Cool. Awesome. Okay. I might be rushing a little bit of this, but I really wanna get into like some of the more, in, uh, more information that pertains to y'all, which is here. So based on all the research that I've done in terms of who are the people that are creating these guidelines, what I found was that the people that are mostly creating these guidelines that I've seen that are being passed around the internet that are the ones that have major websites around them are large coalitions of US physicians and other healthcare workers such as nurses and other uh, cl clinicians in different healthcare settings that have come together, created these guidelines. They're working with people on the front lines to be able to say, hey, we did the peer reviewed research that we try to look up as much information as we can and then also see how it was efficacious in the field. And here's what we found. The problem with this was that everyone was doing their own thing. And there are multiple websites and multiple guidelines now. And so I tried to pick out, to the best of my ability, the ones, the, the specific guidelines that were unique across the board, but that also reflected the research that I just showed you up front. So here it is. Any fabric that you use should be new, unused, breathable, and tightly woven. Now, some of you might ask me, and I got this question earlier today, and I did a little bit more research on it, so I just want to point it out now. The for the type of cotton material that we're looking for is 100% cotton material. Whether that's gonna be a cotton poly blend or a cotton gauze is very critical. This is just my speculation. I haven't backed this up with any research, evidence-based research, but what I've seen in the studies that I've looked at, a cotton poly blend in the, in, in the real world, the way that they disinfect it might actually damage the fibers because some ways that people are disinfecting these blends inside the hospital are either through um, using alcohol, like a high level, of, high, high level of alcohol, or a high level of a chlorine solution. With that in mind, if the specific cotton poly blend that you use has a fabric that retains some of the chlorine molecules onto the fabric, which does happen, which is why some of our t-shirts might smell if we jump into a pool and it smells like chlorine. That chlorine sticks onto that even after it dries for a little while. If people were to breathe that in, it could, it could be a potential risk of toxic. Uh, they could have a be at potential risk 
for toxic exposure to chlorine. So there's one condition there. Another issue is uh, sometimes a cotton poly blend might not work well in a uh, specific type of sanitation you, uh, me me uh, mechanism, which is heating at very high temperatures. Um, the recommendation in the guideline is to heat the fabric, the 100% cotton material, at boiling water for 10 minutes. And the reason we do that is to pre-wash the fabric so that it gets shrunk and it's at the size that which they will then re-sanitize again. But the boiling water for 10 minutes kills 99.9%, .9%, if not 100% of germs, including viruses and bacteria. So that is a, one of the recommendations that we found that helps protect the workers against um, potential viruses and germs before it gets used. For the ear loops, we want to have them to be elastic. Fold over elastic is fine, but make sure that that elastic has no latex. Um, the type of material that the elastic that I've seen in some of the uh, guidelines from these websites were a polyester and spandex blend, which is safe in the heating, in the heat, in, in when you heat it in water. Um, some of the guidelines showed that if you include a pocket, it allows them to put in, allows the healthcare providers themselves to put in a removable filter. Now, the efficacy of the removable, the removable filter can be debatable depending on what the filter is. Some, some of the, st some guidelines show that, you know, you could use a tea bag as a filter. You can use those HEPA filters from the vacuum cleaner as a filter. Um, for your own safety, I wouldn't recommend putting in a filter yourself just because it may not follow the guideline that the healthcare providers have laid out. But if they have already laid out those guidelines, then I think it's more than okay to donate those, um, donate masks that have filters in them. Just to reiterate, it's very important that you always refer to the guidelines provided by the hospital center that, they're, that, you're rece that are receiving your donation. Um, because they know ahead of time what types of sanitation methods they're using on their end to make sure that they will go ahead and sanitize, make sure that it's sterilized for, the, for their own um, healthcare providers to use. So these are just general guidelines that people should follow as a baseline, as a benchmark, based on an aggregate of all the information out there on the internet, but really refer to the guidelines that are provided by the hospital center. Um, this is a really great um, petition that is currently out. Uh, it, and it, it's, it was created by physicians from University of San Diego Hospital. And they're the ones that initially crowdsourced a list of best practices and then shared it across multiple different areas on the internet. Now, since then, that list hasn't been the most updated. So there's a lot of hearsay and anecdotal information. So the best website that I've found, uh, I will share with you later on in this slide deck. Now that we know what patterns, or sorry, now that we know what fabrics we should use, let's go and talk about some of the patterns. I'm just gonna talk about this slide very briefly because I'm not a pattern maker, I am not a sewer, I have no technical skills in that realm whatsoever. But these specific patterns were listed on a website called getusppe.org, which is a coalition of nine or 10 different uh, organizations across the US that are grassroots movements of healthcare providers, researchers, and uh, other, other uh, public health professionals who have come together and looked at the research, looked at what's applicable for their community specifically, and created these patterns around that. Uh, and created uh, guidelines around the whole concept of donated PPE, whether that's PPE that was donated by an individual like ourselves, or from a fashion brand, or from a manufacturer, they have specific stakeholder um, guidelines on their website. So if you go to getusppe.org, I would highly suggest checking out all any of these patterns. I do want to talk about, for a brief moment, this pattern right here, the University of Florida mask. And earlier it was mentioned that there's guidelines on the internet that are being thrown out in the last week 
specifically about how to make an N95 mask. If I'm not mistaken, that those guidelines are probably this mask. So at the University of Florida, the anesthesiology program, their physicians created a specific filtration mask that they believe could be just as effective, if not more effective than the N95 mask. They do have disclaimers that it's not approved by any certification body, it's not approved by the CDC, it's not approved by NIOSH, which is one of the governing bodies that protect occupational workers' health and rights. It's not approved by anyone. They just based this idea off of what the materials were being used in medical grade PPE, and then they created a mask and a pattern around that, around those materials and around that specific pattern. Create that mask with caution. Ask the hospital workers about this specific mask, if they've heard it, would they benefit from it? They will know more about the efficacy of that mask than anyone. I put this on here though, just in case, because this specific mask is gaining traction in the healthcare community. So I am monitoring it to see if it's gonna be efficacious and if it's gonna be like a, a, a standard, if you will, for what these face masks could be like in the future. Um, the main reason why I don't like that, that specific mask is because it requires the use of medical grade fabrics, which is really expensive, really hard to find, and you probably have to have some level of um, requirements to meet, that you, you probably have to meet some level of requirements, and this is just my speculation, to be even able to purchase that type of material. So definitely look at that with caution and approach it with the best practices in mind by talking to the hospitals that you're gonna go and donate to. How's everyone doing so far? Awesome. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about where to donate. I'm sorry? No, I was just saying, um, this is great and easy to follow, thank you. I'm so glad, I'm really glad. Uh, let's talk about donations because there's no point in creating all these wonderful masks and not really knowing where to go. I looked at about seven or eight different websites and I picked three out of my own opinion. You can, you can definitely look up some of the websites that are in conjunction with these websites, but I picked these three specifically for good intentions. The first intention was I wanted to make sure that it was usable that it was easy to navigate for people like us who may not know the scientific jargon, may not know where to go. These three websites were very useful to be able to understand what we need to do, where to go, and who do I need to call. So these were great. Secondly, these specific websites focused mainly on the masks, mainly on the face masks, but they, and then, they, they then extended it to medical grade masks if you have it in your in your homes you can donate it to and where to donate it and you also had other ppe so where it says find the mask they have guidelines on where to donate um, plastic shields on mask match same thing their actual specialty is con uh, connecting people with real n95 masks to healthcare workers so they kind of help you figure out the logistics with that which is really cool Find the masks is a is a part of that is a part is a is part of the coalition that I mentioned with getusppe.org. They're like the Google for where do I where do I donate my mask, which was really great. So they have a very easy to look at repository of all the different hospitals and and some guidelines uh, if the hospital has provided them the guidelines about what to donate and what they're looking for. But then they also have the like the contact information about a hospital near you. So if you call that hospital, you can say, hey, I found your information in findthemasks.com. I wanted to know what type of masks you were looking to get, uh, gather. I've got some guidelines. I've done the work. Um, where can I donate them? How can I donate them? So they, this was a really great resource. And then the last one for my students out there who are in college and have been forced to get, get kicked off campus, Med Supply Drive was kind of a, an initiative that was created in response to some of these really adverse challenges. It's a community of student-led volunteers that are working across the country to donate actually any urgently needed protective supplies. So it's not just face masks. They also do other PPE as well. And if you want to stay connected with a, a national 
nationally run and nationally student-led organization. I'm talking everyone from undergrad to like people in medical school. It is a great opportunity to network and get your your voice and your face and your your work out there. Um, and I think the way that they work, I haven't fully vetted it, but I think the way they work is doing local donations. So they gather and collect locally sourced donations of medical supplies and they come together and they package it and then they and bring it to the hospitals that are requesting this. So at the very end, we're gonna make sure in our email, we send you this entire slide deck so you can click on each of these websites and follow along, or sorry, and um, follow it your own, at your own leisure. So that way you can go ahead and put, put the stuff out there. Um, let's see. Now, before I go into the Q&A, and again, I know that there's only 10 minutes left, so um, I'd love, if you all can stick around afterwards, I'd love to answer any of the questions. I'll try to answer the questions to the best of my ability. Before I go into the Q&A, I do want to talk about one thing that I forgot to mention. In the materials, how should I use them? How should I donate them? One of the guidelines is to make sure that you package them in Ziploc bags, unused plastic bags. It has to be put into plastic because that, in the best sense, can provide an airtight seal. So that is one of the things that these websites will let you know when you're donating. They'll, they'll, they'll have like a final check mark, like was it this, was it this, was it this? And they'll walk you through the whole process, which is what I also really liked about these websites. With that said, I would love to open the floor for any questions. Um, and anyone in the community has an answer to a question, you're more than welcome to answer on my behalf because I'm just one person and uh, this is just one perspective. So thank you again, everyone. And, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what we can share with one another. Um, I believe yeah. there's- If we Go wanted ahead. to start with Bailey's question um, that was asked earlier, it was on um, the CDC has been advising healthy people to not wear masks because it creates a wet, damp environment perfect for the virus to land and infect a healthy person. Yet there's this video coming out of the Czech Republic that says they're flattening the curve by making everyone wear the mask when they go outside. So kind of like, what's the, what's the best thing to do in that regard? Um, I wish I could be the one to answer that question. I wish I was a healthcare professional. I wish I was like Anthony Fauci, Dr. Fauci, and tell you the right answer. But because we live in the US, and it's best to follow the guidelines that the US sets because of the way that the pandemic is um, spreading and occurring in our, in our, in our, in our country um, from what I've seen in the past. So if we, this is something that Riza found and I'm really grateful that she did. When you look in the past and you look at how we've reacted to specific in, um, issues in, in um, specific pandemics, large, like one of the examples was um, the avian flu, the Spanish flu of 1918, wearing face masks, like general public wearing face masks was a common thing. Um, but I think that because of how much research that has come out since then about the evolution of the fabric mask, why we actually even need an N95 mask to begin with, what, what, whether it would protect us against this specific disease or not, should be left up to the medical professionals, should be left up to the research scientists. Um, and I think there's my, this article right here might talk more about um, whether the coronavirus masks, like wh whether everyone should wear the masks or not. It's, it's, um, it's one of those areas that I leave it up to like my, my superiors, right? Like the people that are on the ground doing the research that are, that are creating the guidelines, the, the task force, if you will. Uh, from my perspective, should everyone wear a mask? In my opinion, I, I personally don't think everyone needs to wear a mask. But I do think that people who are at risk populations, I do think that elder populations, uh, people with immunocompromised conditions, maybe they should wear a mask. Um, but I, I can't impose that on anyone. And I think that's also someone's moral imperative to whether they want to or not, given the country that we live in and given the conditions that we're um, uh, operating in. So that's my take on it. I have a question. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for this presentation. It was very informative. I learned a lot. Um, but I was wondering if you knew of any um, 
bigger communities or partners um, that are providing materials for the masks. Um, I'm not in a position right now to pay for the, uh, the mask materials, but I know that there are smaller local ones, like I saw one at Atlanta, um, where they basically provide you with the mask, you make it, you return it to them. Um, and I would love to be a part of something like that. Do you know of any, I mean, I, or someone from the community, I know there's a lot of people on this call. Uh, I have a few thoughts on that, but I'd love to open that question up to, the, to, to anyone else that would, I could, that would be able to answer that. Um, so in regards to that question, I think that what I've seen, um, Joanne Fabrics is kind of trying to provide their own patterns and they're staying open right now to kind of provide this uh, opportunity for people to make masks and such. Now, I would personally go to a, a Joanne Fabrics and, because I can buy a 100% cotton um, uh, material that isn't used, that wasn't created uh, as a part of a t-shirt, and it was just dedicated for, as a, just dedicated to be used as a fabric. Um, but I, I don't know if any of these websites have locations and where to buy the materials. Um, they might. If you're in New York City, I know there's a really cool organization called um, Masks for Medicine that is doing a lot of donation drives from local uh, fashion uh, designers and, and, and garment makers in, in the New York City area that are doing collections and doing their own sanitation in an autoclave, which is one of the methods that physicians and clinicians use in the hospital to sanitize the masks themselves. So that's been a very powerful initiative in New York City, but I don't know if there's other local organizations that are doing that city by city. My guess is to go on Facebook or on Google and, and like type in city name local mass donation or local mass creation. And maybe then you might be able to find some uh, communities, community groups that are, that are working together to create those and provide those resources. Thank you. Just sure to thing. add to that, if I may, for one second. Please. Um, the, the biggest resource I found, I'm in New York City, the biggest resource I found of um, fabric donation, supply donation is on Instagram. To be honest, that's really interesting. It's the same. It's the same concept that he was just talking to, about, but just a different platform. So if you find a couple mask make mask makers out there, usually you'll be able to find their links of donation, because that's that's kind of what we're doing here as well. So. well thank you so much. I'm not sure who's speaking, but thank you, <laughs> Maria. Thanks so much for uh, chipping in, Maria. Appreciate that. Uh, any questions? Any more questions? I have a I have a quick question. Um, yeah. One of the uh, thank you for this entire presentation. Very informative. Um, one of the hospitals uh, in Toronto is asking for um, uh, very specific uh, fabric. So they're saying um, polyester for the outside in a dark color, and then 100% cotton on the um, inside that goes against your skin. Do you have any insight as to why that would be? I actually saw that specific guideline and in terms of the differences in the materials, I'm not sure. Uh, I think there's a Facebook group uh, dedicated to that, that pattern, dedicated to that fabric. Um, and it was created by, by those specific hospital workers. Uh, so you might want to check out that Facebook group. I can try and find it and put it in the, in the links uh, for, cool. you to, uh, for you to look at and see if they've okay. updated those guidelines. I think those guidelines were created a long time ago, like two or three weeks ago. Um, okay. But in terms of the fabrics, I'm not sure why they're suggesting polyester on the outside and cotton on the inside, but I do know for a fact why they're choosing a, a lighter color and a darker color. And the reasoning was that for the clinician, choosing a, a, a contrast of colors allows the clinician to know what side is facing the disease and what side is facing the mouth. So that way they don't accidentally contaminate themselves when they're putting uh. on the mask again. So that was the color, the color choice and the contrasting color choice. Right. But I'm not sure why they might be using polyester versus and, and cotton. Um, okay, thank you. So what Jeff said, uh, maybe in terms of absorbency, so polyester is less absorbent. And so maybe that's in terms of it's more moisture wicking, which is why they would want to use those. Um, and it might be more protective against the, uh, the splash or against fluids. Um, mm. And I think that that's plausible. 
Um, but then that polyester has to be laced with some special uh, metal ions or some sort of met um, some sort of uh, metal lining, which is what surgical masks have, which allows mm -hmm. them to um, capture some of those viruses and bacteria through through like uh, through polarization. So just plastic alone, I don't think is enough. Or sorry, polyester alone isn't enough. But that's just from the research that I've gotten. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and, 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 and Victoria did point out that I did say that cotton blends are a little better as a mask material overall, which is what that research study showed earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yes, because of the cleaning methods that we have to, that we're subjugated to now, it's to reuse a cloth mask with specific cotton blends is challenging. Um, it might damage the actual efficacy of the filtration rate right, to begin with. Now the surgical masks have that poly blend material of, of polyester with a special metal lining inside of it uh, because they're disposable. So that allows them to use the, that to their advantage. Because we're re thinking about reuse and we're thinking about long-term use, it changes the game a little bit. And it, it's harder to do a research study around that currently. Um, Tran, uh, Hung Tran says that for those in Canada, there's also a sewing group that might be in touch with healthcare workers. Uh, and yeah, so that's the Facebook group that I was talking about. So it's in the chat oh. box. Um, they're the sewing group that's working with the healthcare workers, I think specifically in, in Toronto, Canada sews, that is providing some of these um, opportunities and resources for, for, our, for our neighbors up, up north. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we're sharing with one another and this is great. Um, now, uh, since it is nine o'clock, I would like to ask for the last question. Um, is there any other questions for me? I have a question. Um, if nobody else has anything, if not, I can follow up with you personally, Juma. Of Leah course. Um, we, we have one, time for one more question, and then and then we'll we're, we'll wrap up. Yeah. So mine was um, I've been researching um, this because we have I have a couple of folks who can sew and how to help. You know. Um, but, uh, we don't have the materials, as you said, for medical ones, and it would just be fabric based. And I've been reading a lot of articles on, um, other countries and their, their positioning on whether, um, you know, people who aren't, um, sick wearing the masks, since this is a asymptomatic, uh, virus and what that recommendation would be on that. Um, and so, as a brand, um, you know, I want to be able to like provide this, but I want to understand, um, you know, what what kind of concerns are there. Um, in the so to long story short, there's a cultural stigma in the U.S. for the general public to wear masks. Um, right. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for people to adopt. Why it's that why why based consensus on mask use? If we look yeah. into the science behind it, it reusing a so based on the research study that I showed you earlier um, about the cloth mask. So the way that they wash that cloth mask in Vietnam was just regular soap and water, um, and there's no real guideline. Uh, there's no real research showing whether that soap that soap and water washing degraded the, the materials, if that constant rewash made it less likely to filter bacteria, less likely to filter viruses. Um, and so, so you have to like, I think you have to outweigh, you have to weigh it, well, the scientific principles behind this whole concept and then the cultural ac acceptance. I do think that if someone is at risk, I think it's safe to make them a, a, a DIY face mask that is reusable um, with some of these guidelines in mind. If they have access to a real surgical mask, that's even better. Um, and then they can toss it out and then they can put on another one because it, ultimately it's gonna protect them against the people around them. I still, from because I'm a public health person, I really believe in harm reduction and more evidence-based grounded practices. I would, I would walk away from having everyone wear a face mask because it, it because of the con the culture and the science and everything around it is shaky in this country but it might be stronger in other countries and it's just harder to, for us to find that research or find those guidelines 
but I would say like washing your hands, practicing safe social distancing, everything that everyone's been preaching so far, is probably the best way to go about it. I, I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question properly, but um, that's like my stance on it. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate it. This was really informative. I, I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. If you want more resources and guidelines for PPE development and donating, go to getusppe.org. Out of every resource that I looked at, this website was a accumulation. Uh, it's a coalition, basically. It's a grassroots coalition of multiple organizations around the country coming together and providing one place resource for questions like this. Perfect. So definitely check them out. That's where I got the patterns. Um, some of the guidelines that I got were also from this website, but I cross-tracked it against other guidelines. So that is like the biggest resource that I think we could go for. And I think it's going to be the best resource for a while. Awesome. Thank well, you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Ramil, for doing this research and uh, making it so easy for us to for us to understand. Um, we really appreciate this. For everyone on this call, we'll be following up with this presentation, which has a lot of these act uh, links to click on that Ramil provided. Um, so you'll be seeing that in email from us as well. And if you want to keep learning how you can help your medical community to how you can help support garment makers who really are some of the most vulnerable among among us during this crisis. Um, you can go to remake.world to learn about the initiatives and other pieces that we're bringing forward around creating an emergency relief fund for garment workers. And you can also follow us on Instagram at remake.world. And we really hope that you join us again for another one of these conversations. Uh, thank you all for, especially on the East Coast, for spending your, your night with us. We appreciate it. Yeah. And I thank you for people from other countries for jumping in, especially if your timelines don't align right now and you sh should be asleep. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all.